Good morning and thank you for joining today's webinar, Understanding Your Risk and Liability. I am Brett Brenner, President of the Electrical Safety Foundation International. This is the first webinar in a series addressing issues associated with counterfeiting, specifically as it pertains to the electrical industry. This series is part of ESFI's Zero, Zero Tolerance for Counterfeits campaign to help raise awareness about the threats posed by counterfeit electrical products. A special thanks goes out to our program contributors who include Eaton, Hubble, Schneider Electric, and Underwriters Laboratory. I invite you to visit our website for free infographics, survey results, videos, and other materials we have developed for this year's program to help educate the electrical industry and the consumers about the issue. Before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. You can submit any questions that you have on the module on our website, or you can submit them through Twitter using the hashtag ESFI anti -counterfeiting. I invite your questions regarding this webinar or potential future topics. You can email them to info at ESFI.org. Now let's get started. Over the past decade, U.S. seizures of counterfeit products have increased more than 325%. By your attendance today, you're aware of the threat to public health and safety for these counterfeit products. Today's webinar is titled Understanding Your Risk and Liability. Counterfeits are getting more sophisticated and harder to identify. Just who's responsible for ensuring their, their legitimacy? To help answer those questions and others, let me kick it over to our guests. DJ Smith, the Brand Protection Group Manager for Procter & Gamble, and Clark Silcox, who's General Counsel at the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, or NEMA. Thank you both for joining us today. DJ, can you describe the trends you're seeing regard, in regards to counterfeit and what you see in the marketplace? Yes, uh, Brett. First, I'd like to thank the ESFI for putting together this webinar. It's a very important topic, and, and I appreciate all that uh, you're doing in, in protecting the safety of the, especially the U.S. consumer. Um, each year, U.S. companies are losing billions of dollars to counterfeit goods around the world. In fact, the International Anti-Counterfeiting Coalition, the IACC, estimates that uh, traffic in counterfeit goods is reaching $600 billion globally each year. And many people feel the risk of counterfeits is not that great, especially here in North America. They think it's a luxury goods problem or that it's um, contained to third world markets. That is, that is incorrect. Counterfeiters now target um, goods and services from all industries. We're talking from electronics to consumer goods to um, DVDs, as, as people know, um, e-commerce. Uh, so so they're, they're targeting uh, all kinds of goods. And they range um, from those categories uh, the reason that that's happening, or one of the reasons that it's happening, is that um, counterfeit criminal convictions is actually less risky for organized criminals. And they have organized networks, so they, they can go into jail or be, be convicted. Far stiffer penalties for a small drug conviction or trafficking of Ill illegal weapons versus trafficking in counterfeit goods. So um, because they have these global supply chain networks uh, put together, they will uh, utilize those networks. And it used to be that another reason that counterfeiters uh, typically fence their goods on, at street level, we used to call it. Uh, but now um, a counterfeiter can sit in their home uh, anywhere in the world and um, take orders, set up a counterfeit operation and ship those orders right from the convenience of their home here to consumers, direct to consumers in the United States. So it's become easier to fence those, those illicit goods. And, and um, still the majority of, of counterfeit, especially electronics, are coming out of China uh, that we see. Okay, and Clark, what do you, what do you see in, I guess, with your membership and, and what kind of feedback are you getting in terms of what are the causes? Uh, the expansion of, um, of, of digital commerce, digital communications, has uh, certainly uh, enhanced the reach of counterfeiters, people who are actually manufacturing the fake products, um, to uh, not only consumers here in the United States, but also to the supply channel as well. Um, we recognize that uh, certainly that most e-commerce is quite legitimate. 
but, um, but, but digital commerce and digital communications has opened the door for, for illegal commerce. I mean, 20 years ago, I would have told you that email was the format of, of digital commerce uh, that uh, the counterfeiters use to reach out. Somebody might go to a trade show somewhere in Asia or somewhere else around the world, drop off their business card with an email address on it, and by the time they got back home, uh, the, 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 the manufacturer or the trader in the illicit goods was, was reaching out to you with that email address. But now it's, 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 it's and we're seeing this in, in some industries like pharmaceuticals and apparel, media products like film and, and music, um, uh, entire websites that are fake. And it's very difficult for the consumer to, uh, to, to realize that, uh, that uh, this is not the genuine brand manufacturer, but it sure looks like the genuine brand manufacturer's website. Um, and they're selling exclusively a single brand or a single range of, of products. But then there's also, and this is quite insidious as well, a sort of a what, I call, what I call a mixed-use website, where you have the, um, um, uh, perhaps the counterfeiter selling their own brand of product, uh, but on top of that, they will show you pictures of what are clearly the other genuine brand manufacturers' uh, products and basically saying, look what else I can make for you. You know, please give us a call or please send us an email. Mm -hmm. And so... That has probably been the most dis significant development that has enhanced the reach of the illicit traders in the past 10, ten years. Okay, so it's a, it sounds like it's harder and harder to, to figure out what's legitimate, what's not legitimate. It's, it's a matter of the due diligence you put into the process yourself when you're purchasing these goods. So what's being done, uh, Clark, in terms of the support of the industry and private sector? Like, wh What's going on? What do you see what's going on that, that's helping in this fight? Well, one thing is for sure is the, the, the establishment of the public-private partnership between the United States government and, um, and, and private industry has, uh, has been a huge factor in the, in the support of, of industry and the private rights holders in this area. Uh, the U.S. government clearly recognizes the threat and the harm, um, and the, so they've been a terrific partner. Uh, and this is a nonpartisan issue, Brett. It, it's 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 something that both in the executive branch and in the uh, and in the uh, legislative branch that they've dealt with. So there's been a steady stream of, of investigations and criminal prosecutions and convictions. Yes, I agree with with what DJ said that uh, that in terms of the uh, uh, sort of the hierarchy of, of penalties that exists, uh, counterfeiting is probably I don't want to call it a slap on the wrist, but in terms of the rankings, uh, it's it's not the penalties are not as high as as the drug trafficking and that sort of thing. So it presents less of a risk to the bad guys in that regard. But certainly, Congress enacted the Pro IP Act several years ago and established uh, an IP enforcement coordinator here, and that has uh, sort of brought. We can see the industry can see this. It's brought together the the government's resources in a in a coherent way to 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 assist industry. Government has a three prong approach. Uh, they uh, they they are actually engaged overseas with our trading partners on this, trying to not only build infrastructure and capacity for for dealing with uh, uh, counterfeitings, you know, outside of, uh, counterfeiting outside the United States, and sort of coordinated law enforcement overseas. But they're also engaged at the ports, and if the goods should pass through the ports and into this country, uh, immigrations and customs enforcement is quite active in in in, cr in criminal investigations and prosecutions. Um, having focused on Uncle Sam, I don't want to overlook the fact that state and local governments have been valuable partners in cities like New York and Los Angeles and Miami, uh, but also in rural and suburban uh, uh, areas, authorities are known to take action against uh, the counterfeits uh, and the counterfeiters that are distributors um, in, in their jurisdiction. And, and finally, also, the financial industry has stepped forward um, and credit card companies and banking institutions have been suspending relationships with their customers when they learn that their institution is being used by those customers uh, for illegal purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's, th there's a lot of partners in this effort. Uh, I fear the work will never be done. Uh, that's just the nature of this criminal beast. But, um, but, uh, but there is a, a coherent approach that's being applied to, to help the brand owners out. And it sounds like information is, is key in this, you know, sharing information up and down the supply channel. 
Um, do you have anything to add to Clark's point in terms of what you're seeing out there? Yeah, thanks, Brett. I, I'll, I'll first start with um, the, the industry, uh, the, the groups such as yourself, the ASFI, um, has, and, and NEMA, uh, when you look at what NEMA has done, when you look at what the IACC has done um, on the promotional realm from counterfeited, you have the CIC, everybody's got these acronyms, um, with, with support of rights holders or manufacturers. So that support is so critical for us um, in, in helping that. So one, we appreciate the, the support that these groups are giving. We have a, a, a group that typically um, Grocery Manufacturers of America and, and FMI, different groups are, are, um, are actually um, helping to, to um, address the issue because as Clark said, some of the laws, um, criminal laws, are not as strong as we would hope them to be or like them to be, and those things are being addressed. From the public sector side, law enforcement um, has really stepped up um, to help industry, especially in the United States, and I will say around the world, even in China, they have done some uh, terrific work out there. So partnering with law enforcement on this is really one of your most effective ways to fight, fight this. And in the federal government, they've actually, um, because they're, sometimes for a manufacturer, it's like, where do I go to get help? They've developed um, what they call the, the IPR, the Intellectual Property Rights Coordination Center. And they call it the IPR Center, right here in Washington, D.C. And they stand at the forefront of the U.S. government's fight against uh, counterfeiting. Um, I have in my notes here, I don't, I don't want to mis misquote this, but I, I took this off their web page, the mission of the IPR Center is to ensure national security by protecting the public's health and safety, the U.S. economy and our war fighters, and to stop predatory and unfair trade practices and threaten the global economy. So what this organization does is bring together 21 international and federal agencies together. So I, I call it my one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. um, if I have an issue, uh, I can go to the IPR center, present my, my issue, and they can then say, well, you know, that may be better served here locally or at this, with this federal agency, it may help you. And then um, in addition, um, many, especially in our major cities, many local law enforcement agencies have um, created commercial fraud units that are, are there to help um, with, um, with the counterfeit issue. So. Um, the government, uh, especially law enforcement, has really been a, a key support uh, in the fight of, against counterfeits. Well, I think in, in terms of what the electrical industry it, itself is doing, it's, it's not unlike what other industry and distribution channels are doing, too. So it's an interesting, you would think that they would have no parallels, but the distribution channel is many times the same. And so uh, the, the message I keep getting from folks across the country is it's the information that you share, but then it's also how are you reporting that up and down the supply channel, and that's where the, where the government and the IPR center, that's why it was, it was created, to allow anybody uh, attending this, this, this webinar to go ahead and report things that they see, think are suspicious. So you're supposed to go to the manufacturer, or what, what you think is counterfeit, maybe it's the, UL, uh, the, the branding, uh, whether, whether it's the uh, certification mark. Uh, but the IPR center is a great place to start uh, th that process and they're trying to make it as easy as possible for both the consumer as well as uh, uh, people within the electrical supply chain to report it back up um, and I think that, that that's one of the keys that we're, tr we're trying to come away with to say look it's up to each of us to kind of take our, our stance and make sure that people understand what's going on. Right. Um, next question so in terms of liability the organizations uh, what can organizations do that are being impersonated I mean do you, do you see do you see what, what actions are they taking to, to kind of fi fight the counterfeiters, if you will? Clark's the lawyer, so he can. <laughs> uh, the um, uh, counterfeiters, uh, excuse me, uh, genuine brand owners um, uh, often take the lead on this because it's their brand that, that is implicated in this. Um, and there's a, a case I'm familiar with, a legal case from us several years ago uh, in the pharmaceutical industry that sort of um, highlights the um, uh, some of the things that manufacturers are are, are forced to do to sort of shore up their own distribution channel uh, to ensure that um, uh, that that counterfeits don't intrude that that distribution channel. Uh, it was a case involving the uh, pharmaceutical company Amgen involving a drug called Epigen, 
Um, it, it started out as a, as a product liability suit because a patient who had gone to a reputable retailer, CVS, the drugstore chain, uh, bought the epigen on a prescription from, the, from their physician following some surgery. Uh, the patient did not either stabilize or get better. I think the medication was primarily aimed at, at stabilizing the patient you know, post-surgery. And what happened was is that his health, his condition deteriorated and ultimately um, um, the, the harm and the death uh, resulted. But the, um, uh, what that case indicates is the, the court may be willing to entertain a sort of a negligence claim against an authorized distributor uh, for allowing um, uh, counterfeit products to enter their, their supply channel. Um, and in that case, it involved the fact that they, uh, the authorized distributor had engaged extensively in trading in with gray market goods, which by the way are genuine goods, but nevertheless, it became very difficult in trafficking with that, that gray market segment uh, to determine whether all the goods were really genuine or whether they were also fake. And that's how the, the, um, the, the, the counterfeit epigen entered the, the, the drug supply channel. So it was, again, a negligence claim, not a purely a counterfeiting claim, but it resulted in counterfeiting uh, kind of liability. Um, a trial court may also consider um, whether the brand owner um, could be accused of the same negligence in sort of failing to manage their supply channel uh, in a way that um, uh, kept the counterfeits out. I think that's a harder case to prove, because, but nevertheless, um, uh, when, the, uh, when the, the trial court did consider that claim in that case, ultimately dismissed uh, the manufacturer, but, but still it's, it's, a, it's a legal threat to the manufacturer. So that's a message to manufacturers to manage their supply channels well to ensure that if there is, if you know of a risk of counterfeits that present unsafe uh, products, um, you know, you need to have a process in place to perhaps train, educate your your channel partners, but also to ensure that, the, that the, they're aware of the counterfeits uh, getting into the marketplace. Um, the other thing that might alert manufacturers uh, and brand owners to the counterfeiting problem would be excessive warranty claims. Um, sometimes the brand owner might not realize it right away, uh, but re when return products come in, uh, if they come in at an excessive level, naturally you're gonna say, what happened here? Now, possibility is, there was a manufacturing defect somewhere um, you know, within the company or within their supply channel, and they, they need to fix it. But uh, I have heard of a number of cases where, in fact, the excessive warranty claims are actually attributable to not their own product, but to a, to a counterfeit uh, uh, product. And um, the problem for the manufacturers there, of course, is they process these warranty claims not realizing that they're paying off <laughs> for a return of a product that they didn't make, and so they're, they're getting whacked in a, twice. In a in twice, yeah, in a number of ways there. So. But I think it, it's a unique situation where, you know, the manufacturer ultimately um, wants to make sure that their brand and their mark is, is protected. And so what they're trying to do is, is really get out there to make sure that, you know, things are on the up and up. And it takes time for them sometimes to process if nobody's telling them there's an issue uh, to really investigate it enough to figure out if it is, in fact, a counterfeit. Um, and many times, you know, we, we hear mark holders and brand owners that were willing to stand behind the product, even if it's not theirs, because it does have their name on it. Um, but that doesn't excuse the liability uh, on the part of your due diligence that you've gone through the supply channel in the correct way. Um, so uh, can you speak to anything that you know about, DJ, that, that, that on the liability, I mean, you don't know what you don't know is kind of my grandfather's old term, but that's not an excuse in, 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 in the court system, I think. Um, and I think that's something that people on this webinar need to realize is that you are ultimately responsible for what you're installing or what you're, what you're doing in the supply channel. Um, what kind of things have you seen? The, the, um, the, the criminal liability, as Clark said, does not lie with the, the rights holder. It, um, however, the court of public opinion is what can be um, more damaging. And so, you know, our recommendation for a rights holder is that they have a strong brand protection program, to Clark's point. Um, however, the manufacturer is, has set up their, their um, uh, what do I wanna say, their, um, not their barriers, but their, um, the knowledge points. So 
how they, they get to know, hey, there's a problem out there. So do they have strong linkages between their legal department, their consumer complaint department, their warranty department, those types of things. If you have those things in place, um, the early warning systems, that's what I was trying to say, the early warning systems can help you identify very quickly and then protect, the, protect your mark and protect the consumer. Okay. Now, one of the questions we have is uh, th when it comes to you don't know what you don't know when you're using the product unknowingly, is intent required in order to be held liable? Is, 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 I've heard that many times to say, I, I just didn't know. That, that's not necessarily an excuse when it comes to, to court and, and a great point in terms of public opinion. I mean, you're unfortunately in the middle of that as a manufacturer, so you want to do what you can, but what are we seeing out there in terms of, of liability? I, I can handle that sure. one um, real quick, and then I'm sure Clark can uh, add on. The, as I said before, the criminal liability does not lie at the feet of the manufacturer, um, but it is very important that they, that they um, have zero tolerance, that they protect their marks. Um, and typically, if, if a consumer purchase, purchases a counterfeit good unknowingly, um, that the criminal liability is, is not there. Um, it's really the manufacturer or the distributor um, of the counterfeit product who knowingly manufactured, purchased that good, distributed that good. Uh, knowledge is a, is a very key element. Um, and then it becomes a criminal violation is, is the knowledge of doing that. And I call that the, the illicit supply chain. Mm -hmm. those, those individuals who are knowingly attacking my brand or someone's brand to make a profit. Okay, those are the, those are the criminals. However, as we said, the court of public opinion can sometimes be more damaging than the criminal courts. Can you imagine if um, a counterfeit electrical component were out there and someone were, were severe, severely injured? Can you imagine the headline that would follow um, that, that incident, okay? And so um, if it's not a big media event and it's not an issue, but a, but a consumer gets uh, a, unknowingly purchases a counterfeit electronic component, com, uh, component. Think about what Clark said. The consumer does not blame the counterfeiter. They don't even blame the person they purchased it from or the uh, whoever knowingly distributed. They blame the manufacturer, yeah. thinking that they manufactured a lower standard of product. And so that that's something that you have to do. Now, from a financial standpoint, even if there's not criminal issues, the financial hit is all along the supply chain, even for the, unknow the unknowing purchase or distribution. Because once it, it comes to, fit, to light that there's a counterfeit out there, when you think about what has to happen now in the supply chain, whoever was, had purchased that unknowingly a distributor, they now have to recall all of that product and, and bring it back at their cost, destroy that product at their cost, and the odds are whoever that distributor purchased it from, if they were the counterfeiter, they're not probably going to see a, a refund of their, of their money. So a distributor can really take a huge financial hit if they don't secure their supply chain. Um, the same with the manufacturer. They have to go through a lot of costs just to make sure that that product does not get into the hands of the consumer. Because that's our ultimate goal, and I'm sure every manufacturer's ultimate goal, is that the consumer only use genuine, fresh um, products that are produced by the manufacturer. And that's why you have to have a strong brand protection program, So, especially in the United States, so consumers um, buy genuine. So, Okay, and Clark, what do you see? Well, the, what DJ just uh, wrapped up with was a description of uh, what we co lawyers call the civil side of the, of the counterfeiting problem. Yes, intent is an element of a crime of, uh, in, in, in virtually all cases. There's very little criminal claims uh, where, uh, where intent is not a part of it. Um, but you have civil forfeiture uh, remedies that are even part of the criminal law as well, but certainly part of, of, of civil enforcement, where a counterfeit product uh, can be seized whether one buys that counterfeit product knowingly or, or unknowingly. Um, if the buyer or a distributor of a product, Brett, has the counterfeit product in their inventory, okay, and I think this is what DJ was getting to, and they've paid money 
for that, uh, they could be at risk for, for, for losing that uh, significant investment in, the, in that inventory. And then there's also a legal risk for counterfeit product that turns out to be defective and, and, and causes personal injury or property damage. And there has been a handful of cases litigated in the courts. I'll never forget the one where one, a NEMA member came to me and said that they first learned that they had a counterfeiting problem because they were named as a defendant in a, in a product liability case. And uh, very quickly, the investigation real, uh, revealed that it was not their product, but in fact, it was a, a counterfeit version of, of their product that they had been sued over. And while the court ultimately uh, uh, re uh, dismissed them from the case, and the case proceeded only against the distributors of the counterfeit product, um, uh, the, the users, the, the distributors were overseas. And to DJ's point, the, the, the ultimate buyer of that product, where the injury occurred, uh, had no recourse uh, to, to go back overseas against the, uh, uh, the person who distributed the counterfeit product, leaving the distribution community community holding the entire bag for the for the civil injury liability in that case. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that, that's, that's a significant concern certainly for the supply channel in this case. And again, that, that kind of liability doesn't depend on you know, knowingly purchasing uh, the, the counterfeit product. And you know, one of the things that uh, ESFI is, is really involved with this for is, to DJ's point, was we're trying to insulate the brands in a way where they're not the bad guys. They're really trying, you, you all are trying to be proactive in going out and finding these illicit goods and trying to figure out how they infiltrate the system. Um, but ESFI and this program, the idea is to make sure that people are looking at this from a public and safety point of view, not from a financial impact point of view. Um, and I think the supply channel, the electrical supply channel, really needs to look at them themselves when it comes to what can we do as individuals in reporting things up and down the supply channel to make sure that people are aware that there are issues. And, and that, that I think, the ulti I, I've heard many times where we did, a, we did a survey recently where we heard that the manufacturers, um, they should be the point person to deal with counterfeits. And to me, that doesn't make any sense if the problem really, rely, really relies on the distribution channel of how these things are getting into the marketplace. You know, ultimately, it's that distribution model that holds the liability. So if you're the distributor, you're the end contractor, you're the one that's going to be held liable, not, not the, f the erroneous or fake mark. Well, it's, it is a two-way street. That's, I mean, that's, that's got to be the reality of it. it, it I, earlier, I described the public-private partnership between information sharing between private industry and, and the U.S. government and state and local governments on, on enforcement uh, in, the, in the public case. But certainly um, within the supply channel, the, somebody is going to learn first whether there's a counterfeit, whether there's somebody's product is being knocked off. I am fairly comfortable with the idea that, um, th with, the, with the notion that our that NEMA manufacturers who uh, have learned from experience that their products, their brands are being knocked off, are talking to their, their channel partners about this. Nobody, I think, is sweeping it under the rug. Um, and then certainly, you know, ma manufacturers have actually taken the step uh, of uh, engaging in civil litigation to get that product off the market or in communicating with the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, which has brought about recalls uh, of that product. So, um, uh, but <coughs> again, even um, there, are, there are people in the field, I like to say, who are the eyes and ears of manufacturers. And that's the, the, the sort of the uh, upstream communication, I think, that has to occur so that, um, that people who see that product in the marketplace or at least suspect it, communicate it to the, uh, the genuine brand owner to make a determination. And then there's a lot going on within industry today where uh, companies um, uh, are maintaining websites where you can actually input certain information that's it's coded, but it's on the product, and you can uh, get back a fairly quick response uh, in some cases uh, as to whether that's a genuine product or not, because the code will either make sense to the manufacturer or it won't make sense, which will be a trigger that, uh, that it's uh, not a genuine product.
And I know that many manufacturers are actually creating a process and when you, which customs and, and other law enforcement groups can actually go through um, a system of checks so they can do pretty quickly to find out if something is erroneous. Um, simple things like information of where the, the good was purchased, if it was even, uh, or excuse me, where it was actually brought in from. So if it was brought in from China but they don't manufacture it, they, they don't have any manufa manufacturing facilities in China, it's a huge red flag. So that's really when the information uh, sharing is, is vital. So in the event of a, like, let's say an injury or a fire or, or a mishap resulting from a counterfeit, uh, you know, who's ultimately held responsible? Who could be held responsible uh, as in your viewpoint, DJ? Well, we've already addressed the criminal responsibility. It's the knowledge element, but um, every point along the supply chain is going to be held responsible. Uh, you know, from uh, we at, at, at uh, our company, um, we believe that that every touch point along the supply chain has the responsibility to secure that supply chain. And when you think about um, the retail and distribution network in North America, U.S. and Canada, it is, I would say, one of the best in the world, if not the best. It's amazing. Um, and the trust that our consumers have in their retailers and distributors in North America, U.S. and Canada, is phenomenal. So think about that word trust that has been built by over years by um, by our distributor, by our distribution network, the secure distribution network. A consumer feels very confident going into their local trusted retailer and purchasing a product or going online and purchasing from a, a trusted um, online retailer or supplier distributor. Um, they feel very confident that what they're going to get is going to work. It was manufactured by the manufacturer and they have the ability to get some of the best pricing anywhere in the world because of our supply chain efficiencies. So it's again who is held responsible? It's going to be where that that break in the supply chain took place. Um, where did that happen? And then and then there will be an examination along the supply chain to say what happened to, to, to allow that to get into the legitimate stream of commerce. Now again, um, we feel very confident uh, about our ability, uh, especially in North America, that the consumer will buy genuine product because of what you just mentioned. We have a very robust program. We also work with partners like yourselves, NEMA, um, and, and other companies like UL, who is uh, amazing, and one of your uh, co-sponsors here at this event, um, who has one of the best programs. And they, they can help us with products that have, have their mark on it. And so um, it, is a, um, it is a very good system that has been set up in North America, and I would hope that uh, manufacturers and distributors, especially you know, that are on this, um, this webinar, um, would take the opportunity of, of these, um, these, these uh, tools that have been giving them to, to protect their mark. Well, I think that, the, the, you know, we, you couldn't have said that any better in terms of in the U.S., we expect something to be at a certain level. I mean, the supply chain has, has, has kind of, we're fortunate enough that, that that's our expectation. But when you go and you start to see in, in Mexico and these other, other places around the world where you're seeing 50% counterfeit, where the expectation is something not to work. If it works, great. If not, you just throw it away and move on. That's literally the way that people think around, uh, you know, other places in the world. We don't, we're we have the luxury of, of kind of expecting and, and, and having the, the assurance that in a brick, or mortar, brick and mortar store, if you follow the supply chain as it's supposed to be followed, somebody is going to stand behind you in the product itself. If you go outside of that supply chain, say gray market that Clark had mentioned before, outside that supply chain to a, a non-licensed uh, you know, distributor, you're putting yourself at risk. And that, that, that is the key, to, I think, to this webinar is to make sure that everybody needs to understand we're fortunate in the fact that if you follow the supply chain, there's going to be somebody standing behind you and supporting you. If you don't, you're putting yourself at risk. And I think that's the big key. And Brett, I'll add one thing to it. Um, think about the opportunity available to our U.S. retailers and distributors globally. The, the world now is their marketplace through, through the World Wide Web. And you mentioned that there are consumers out there, but you know, sometimes it's sad in, in some countries that they don't have the, the, the secure supply chain like we have. Now, of course, we're doing everything that we can and manufacturers are globally to secure that supply chain. Mm -hmm. But think of the opportunity because a consumer anywhere in the world, any country in the world, doesn't want to use uh, a fake 
electronic component that could cause a fire in their home or harm their child. And so by having that secure supply chain that we do have, it actually can be used as an opportunity for our distributors and, and retailers around the world to, uh, to say, hey, we, we are, um, you know, we, we supply genuine products. And, um, and I've seen many use that to their advantage. So let me ask you another question. On the liability side, what, what kind of penalties, I think, are we, uh, what are we seeing out there? I know that there, there isn't an influx of them, but we know that the counterfeits are out there. What are we seeing in terms of penalties, Clark? Uh, penalties and s criminal sentencing will vary, uh, Brett, based on um, a, a number of factors. One is uh, the volume of sales. That's a metric that both courts and prosecutors use under sentencing guidelines to, uh, to, to determine whether a penalty should be higher or lower. And that can be a problem sometimes because the bad guys don't always keep the best commercial records. And so uh, the prosecutors may very well know that somebody who has, uh, uh, you know, they have probable cause to believe has been engaged in counterfeiting and they're in the process of prosecuting through the, through the criminal system, um, engaged in a much larger volume of, of counterfeiting then they actually can find records to substantiate. And so that becomes you know, an issue in the court. And then the other uh, factor that often plays a role is whether there's some cooperation <coughs> from the defendant. Uh, that may occur through a plea agreement, but that plea agreement may also be involved in, well, telling us who you, tell us who your sources are so that we can go back uh, upstream against, the, um, against the, the real suppliers of this product. And so that leads to some variations that I'll describe uh, in right now. There was a case involving counterfeit circuit breakers for which there was a criminal prosecution and conviction uh, just uh, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, the defendant entered into a plea agreement, so there was co some cooperation with uh, the government there. It didn't have to go to trial. Um, and he was sentenced to one year in jail, and he was ordered to pay $60,000 as, as, as part of that plea agreement. On the other hand, um, there was a case in Miami, I, I recall, about eight years ago, and I think uh, Underwriters Labs and, and Duracell Batteries were, were involved in this case, where the defendants got, one defendant I think got eight plus years, and seven, the other one got seven plus years uh, in jail for, for selling uh, not only some brand name luxury goods, but also counterfeit batteries and counterfeit extension cords. And uh, uh, that was a case where there was absolutely no cooperation with, with the defendants. Uh, they were willing to fall on the sword to, to, mm. to, to not provide that information. Um, in the first half of this year, there's been a range of criminal sentences uh, going, I think four cases ranging from 18 months and, uh, and uh, payment of $265,000 to, to over three years in jail time. But just this past week, there was an announcement by, uh, of a court sentence in Los Angeles against a battery distributor uh, to over, uh, he was sentenced to over seven years, I think uh, 88, 89 months in, in jail, something like that. He sold more than 80,000 counterfeit batteries and battery assemblies to the Department of Defense. I mean, this, this is product that worked its way on as, as, as to, uh, to Navy ships, um, aircraft carriers, minesweepers, and, and the like uh, as emergency backup power aboard those, uh, aboard those ships. That was a pretty severe sentence for and that I think, kind of behavior. You know, the, the scope of what we're talking about, I mean, the one the nice part, part about DJ uh, being here and being from Procter & Gamble is you see a, a, a wide variety of products because of under the Procter & Gamble, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, company, you, you are in charge of a lot more th products. And we're talking about health and safety, but the things that we see from counterfeit medicine to, to cosmetics, you name it, we're talking about health and safety, and that's a different animal altogether when you're talking about some of the things we mentioned before, DVDs and those kind of things. Um, what, what kind of prosecutions have you seen? Well, yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because, yes, I, I manage all of our brands uh, for P&G. So we have electronic uh, goods. We have, um, you know, goods that are consumer goods that, you know, people put on their body, they put on their hair, um, electronic devices um, from components. They're in your computers. They're in your flashlight. I mean, just think about um, what happens and an electronic component can be used for brushing your teeth for do you doing all kinds of things that that you are personally using and so the safety element is very important and and that's what you bring up Brett is a very important um, point and that is judges and prosecutors are now being educated by groups such as yours 
um, which is very, very important because in the past, you know, you would go to that and they would think of luxury brands or the watch that somebody sold on a street. You, you, you understand that. And so they were thinking of counterfeit goods in that way. And once they're educated, no, these are goods that you use every day. Uh, there's one example that, that I was involved in up in uh, Michigan where um, the sentence was just um, uh, took place in uh, 2013. Um, and it was a federal investigation uh, against a distributor. I can use the name because it's in uh, JC Enterpri Enterprises. Um, and that, that suspect was um, sentenced to 30 months in federal prison, ordered to pay a $25,000 fine and $400,000 in restitution to the victims. And I wanted to read this part out of the press release because it is so important to what we're talking about. So this is a qu direct qu quote from the Department of Justice press release. In sentencing, the, um, Judge Neff characterized the trafficking of counterfeit merch merchandise as a quintessential white-collar crime that is a serious offense against the public. Judge Neff expressed a desire to send a strong message of deterrence. Along those lines, U.S. Attorney Miles noted, much of our nation's value in the global economy is derived from intellectual property, ideas, brands, innovations, and creations. We must vigilantly protect those properties. Would-be criminals should know that they face prosecution and serious criminal penalties when they steal from companies and the public by committing fraud through counterfeit and pirated goods. So that, that's, I, I, I love that statement because it's showing that prosecutors and judges are being educated and are um, executing the maximum penalties that they can under the laws. And I know that the laws will be strengthened in North America over the coming years on this issue. And again, you know, inf information there is key. And I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, has kind of led to a new age, if you will, is a lot of our, uh, you see a lot more opportunities where I can go online and be a, a distributor um, pretty quickly by just sourcing my own goods. And so the online retail space has opened things up. Uh, you know, anybody can be an expert overnight. Um, and that, that's, I think, what half the problem is. Um, uh, online sales, what has that meant to uh, the marketplace? I mean, that, that's obviously been a game changer, but what are you seeing uh, in terms of online sales? Or what do you see as the future uh, when it comes to online sales and how it's affecting the counterfeits that we see? This That question neatly sort of ties us back to the to the very beginning of, of, of the webinar, Brett. And it's a great question. I I have an anecdote anecdote I'd like to, to share. It, it, it about four or five years ago I received an email from a, a woman in uh, in England, a little bit out of my North American range uh, here, but uh, uh, she had been the victim of counterfeiting. She bought a hair straightener uh, online uh, from a website English language website that, that she found and uh, placed the order uh, for that hair straightener. And, um, and so what did she do when the product failed almost immediately? She calls the genuine manufacturer and not the, not the source of the product for her. Um, and she said, I bought this product that failed. I'd like to exchange it and, and, and get a good one. And so they, they asked her where she bought it from. And she described the website, and then they asked, would you send in the product? And, and evaluation determined rather quickly that it wasn't their, their product. And uh, so there she was without a remedy against anyone. She tried to, to go back to that website where she bought it from and found that it had disappeared. Um, but she had enough information about the website that uh, she was able to provide to me, and what a little bit of research on my part to try to determine why, how did this problem come about? Who was the real source? Was it somebody in England? Was it somebody in Europe? Or was it somebody in some other part of the world? And what we found was in the, able to trace through the URL, when you clicked on this, the, the various links and to find out where the real source was, it purported to be an intermediate school in the middle of rural China. Now, I don't believe for a second that this intermediate school was really the, the source of that product, but that's ultimately what it got traced back to. Uh, the reason I'm skeptical that that was the real source is that this intermediate school in rural China had an English language web page. I mean, we were, we were able to see that, but it was a 
tragic s story where she, you know, where she had laid out, you know, I don't think $100, but, but certainly, uh, you know, a, a significant sum of money for this product. And now she was forced to go back and buy the product all over again. And um, the other part of it, she realized later, she, she was a responsive email she sent to me when I confided in her or what, th where this product had probably come from, was that um, she said, you know, it's, it's one of those, if it was too good to be true, I should have, you know, had an alarm bell going. The, 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 she knew that she had obtained a, a very, very significant price discount for this product over what the, the genuine brand sold for in retail stores. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and and I'll just add on to that, that the, um, the internet is fast becoming the channel, the preferred channel of many uh, counterfeiters. And, um, you know, a lot of people um, get nervous about the, the internet, but from a, a real positive standpoint, um, counterfeiters think they have anonymity hiding somewhere, as Clark gave the example. But um, it, many, many rights holders have robust online monitoring. And the good thing about online is that you can actually overcome what we call the knowledge hurdle, or Clark said the intent, because there is a record of online consumer complaints or, or feedback or things like that. And many of the internet companies, the platform companies, are doing a lot of work with the rights holders. So. Um, from a from an enforcement standpoint, um, don't uh, don't fear the internet. Internet, it does feel sometimes like it's it's overwhelming. But if you use the right resources, um, partner with companies who can help uh, monitor and and enforce on the internet, it actually you can you can really really have an impact in um, in shutting down some of those sellers that are targeting your brands uh, for counterfeit. And groups like eBay are actually providing consumer forums where um, they can uh, uh, type in a comment that uh, that uh, they purchased, you know, unwittingly uh, uh, a counterfeit product uh, using the eBay platform or somebody else's platform. Uh, that's becoming more common too. Yeah, and, and you know, in my personal life as well, it's like you know, you order something off of eBay, you really do trust the the feedback that you, if you would. Um, comment section and, it's, and you got to wonder what it's worth um, but you do find yourself kind of saying well if a thousand people gave a f positive feedback you know maybe there's something there but it only takes one time where they source something bad and you find out pretty quickly there's three or four negative comments and then I purchased purchase personally wouldn't purchase it at all um, so it, it is funny how the online inter uh, the online or internet world is changing everything that we do uh, we got a question uh, from the website it says can you provide an example of an instance where a company handled counterfeiting well. And I'm not going to give that to DJ because I think it could be self-promoting in a way. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, uh, can you give us some examples of, of really what was done correct in a couple of instances? Um, th that's, that's a hard question, but it's also an easy question. I mean, I, I know that there are NEMA member manufacturers who um, have been fairly aggressive in, in, in ridding the product um, of um, from the, from the counterfeit product from the marketplace, um, and unfortunately, they've had to undertake civil litigation uh, to get there, and um, and and sometimes they find that that the that the people who are distributing you know this product uh, um, are are perhaps doing so unwittingly as well, uh, and there's and some of those folks are even in denial that no 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 I I didn't uh, I didn't purchase uh, a, a counterfeit product. But it takes, you, you have to go through the entire civil discovery uh, process, which is time consuming and expensive for all parties to sort of figure out what's right and what's wrong here. Um, but on the other hand, they did it right. I mean, it's, it's, they, and they had to. And the other thing is they, they stepped forward publicly. There, there was, I think, a concern in our industry 10 years ago with manufacturers who were absolutely afraid to talk about this subject. Why? To GJ's point earlier, you know, this is our brand, and if the consumer thinks that our brand is somehow tainted, um, and that they're going to walk away from us and go to our competitor because they haven't heard yet that our competitor has been affected by this pro uh, problem, counterfeiting, but we know they have. But uh, th that uh, th these companies have stepped forward and communicated directly with the public, with the supply chain, 
and and let them know that this is a problem and and the, you know the, the the supply chain and the consumers need to step forward and, and partner with them and I think they did it right as well by going public and 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 not fearing or at least willing to take on the the potential backlash and quite frankly I my my conclusion of, of those efforts has been that they actually enhanced their reputation with their channel partners when they did that and said we're going to rid this uh, insidious product uh, from the supply channel uh, in whatever way we have to in part because with electrical products what we found most of the time Brett is that um, a counterfeit electrical product is, is typically substandard in some way uh, the, uh, the the counterfeiter, the manufacturer, wherever, whether it's China or, or someplace else, needs a price advantage. And the only way, I mean, electrical manufacturers are, in my opinion, reasonably efficient um, in, in, in their manufacturing processes and therefore probably able to get the lowest cost possible in manufacturing that product. So in order for the counterfeiter to beat that, he has to cheat some way. And that may be using a smaller wire gauge and an extension cord than is appropriate for, for, the, for, the, for the power that's going to be drawn in that case. Or it may be that there's, I mean, I've, I've seen photos of entire, uh, an entire circuit breaker where there were no parts inside. It was just a shell and, and a switch. And so it's that kind of cheating that, that creates the margin for the bad guy, makes it so profitable, as DJ said, said earlier. And so that's, um, but but it's, it's stepping, it was stepping forward in the public eye and saying, we've got a problem, we need your help, and, um, and, 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 and taking the aggressive action to get the, the unsafe or potentially unsafe product off the shelves. And how does, how does Procter & Gamble kind of, I mean, wh how would you handle that, I guess? It's an interesting question. Well, we, we have a very strong uh, brand protection program, and we work with our, our supply chain partners to make sure that um, we don't have counterfeit issues and where our, our next line of defense is with federal, you know, customs. We have an incredible relationship. Uh, the Department of Homeland is just uh, an amazing thing. But, Brett, I will, uh, to, to answer that question, um, so I'm not self-promoting or, or doing that, those types of things, um, is the, did you call them the co-sponsors, those companies that you sure. read at the beginning? Sure. I, I know them very well. And they have some very good brand protection programs. What I would recommend for someone who wants to understand the process is find a non-competing company. We do that. Um, we've worked with UL or we'll work with uh, other companies, shoe manufacturer, for example, who we know is very good, um, or, an ele or a, a, a company that we don't compete with, so there's no um, antitrust issues. And, and we will um, ask them, you know, how, how do you do this? Um, you may have a company like UL that is your partner, or we use uh, HP for some of our work. They have their own brand protection programs. Well, we're using them also for other, you know, technology things within our company. Look for those opportunities and talk to these non-competing companies who have been doing this for years. They will help you because we're all trying to continue to keep the U.S. and Canada supply chain to be the best in the world, keep these products out of there. Now, here, here's kind of the, the million-dollar question. Where do you, and we'll start with you, DJ, where do you see this, where do you see counterfeit AIS going? Do you see it as something where it's getting bigger? I mean, I know that the industry has done a lot, uh, at least on the electrical side, has done a lot with educating folks up and down the supply channel of what to look out for. And I think that's caused uh, an increase on the radar in terms of, you know, customs and border folks to be able to identify stuff where we've seen an increase in seizures, uh, which we think is because we've been sharing more and more information. Um, or do you see that as something where maybe that's just a sign of more things are coming in? Where do you see kind of, I guess, the future of, of counterfeits and what we need to do as an industry? That is a great, um, that is a great question. So whoever uh, sent that in, thank you very much because... Um, I'll give you a couple of examples on this, but I'll give you this quote first. I don't know who said it, but I heard it somewhere, so I can't get, you know, I don't want to be accused of, of copyright infringements, right? Just, um, yeah, 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 but I'm going to do the quote, but they, they, they once said, if you don't have a counterfeiting problem, you have a marketing problem. Because if your brand is selling globally, it is being knocked off, mm -hmm. okay? It just, it's today's world. It is um, what is happening. When you have 
uh, it's estimated over 25 million people just in, in China alone that are somehow involved in the counterfeit industry. That's feeding a lot of people. And they're, they're targeting um, the, the brands. And so you've got to work with governments on, on that. And like I said, China's doing a great job actually in trying to, to, to fight this. But it's a huge, huge monumental task. And so think about when the technology or the internet first came about was did you ever hear about internet security or protecting your computer from viruses and things an entire industry cropped up has that gone away no but there was a huge problem that had to be overcome with communicating and the, and the internet and it had to be security okay so that industry has done nothing but grown if you back off of that our computers will be infected overnight okay so we have great especially US companies who have put together programs to help protect us for that as we start and, and we have done a very good job in trying to contain this but it is exploding okay and so it will never go away we have to be very vigilant but as we have these processes and, and things that are put in place that we completely minimize the risk the minute you take your foot off it will it will blossom mm -hmm. okay and so no it's it's going to continue they're going to continue to attack our brands but we're getting better at fighting it and sure. that's that's where i see the future does that okay. make sense yeah absolutely. sounds like job security huh i guess so <laughs> huh <laughs> but i i i i I, I sort of see this phenomenon where you, it, it ebbs and flows, but it's constantly got a trajectory that, that's upward, and I think that speaks to, to DJ's point. But the other side is that even if you, and I think we've had some success here in North America, Brett, in, in the electrical sector in recent years, where you know we, we went through a period of, of three, four years in a row where I was hearing you know, weekly, monthly, whatever, about new reports of, of counterfeit electrical products entering the United States. Uh, I think, especially with channel partner organizations, NEMA partnering with the electrical distributors and the electrical contractors, I think we've had an impact. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've hopefully, at least on the, the demand side, we've decreased some demand here locally. But getting into the other markets sort of away from home, um, still, you, you see the flows. Uh, I just had a conversation with uh, one of our members uh, a couple of months ago about a call they received from, of all people, China Customs. Uh, in China, the, uh, the Customs has the authority at the point of exportation to open up a container, take a look, and, and determine whether there's, there's counterfeit product in there. And I have had a number of reports from our members where they have received these calls. And, the, and, and so um, uh, this is not necessarily something that our members may have been looking for at, at the moment, but these other eyes and ears, and again, going back to something I said at the beginning, this cooperation between U.S. and foreign governments and the investment that we're making over there and helping them build infrastructure and capacity to deal with this, turns out that there was several container loads of, um, of, of some counterfeit electrical products that weren't headed here, uh, at least initially, but they were headed to South America. And it was determined that uh, the proper paperwork indicating that it was an authorized export uh, were not in place. That's what, how China Customs picked it up. And so it was reported that this was not an authorized shipment, and China Customs seized it. It never reached its destination in what I think was Peru or Colombia or someplace like that. Now that product, that was a lot of product to be shipped to that South American country, probably more than any distributor in that country could have handled. So whether it was uh, uh, de destined, ultimately destined yeah. for, for reshipment someplace else, either within South America or perhaps even to the United States is, is another question too. And one, one other point on that is, you know, as China is doing a, 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 I, what, I, what I consider to be a very good job, they're doing a, a lot better at helping uh, the world enforce this, this issue, the, the problem will just move to wherever they can find cheap labor, uh, a, what they believe is a safe haven. So um, even as we start, we continue to work with China to improve the enforcement over there, it just moves, it, it ebbs and flows. So this will be a problem we'll have to face. Um, and continue to fight. 
And, I, and I've heard, and, and so, you know, this isn't a, we said China a lot. Um, and I want to make sure that, you know, a lot of great products do come from China. Yeah. Um, I, but it's one of those things exactly where the counterfeiters are very smart. They're doing a great job at counterfeiting. Um, but they also know customs, and they also know that if they send it to Saudi Arabia first, then it comes to the United States, then, hey, look, they might have a better chance of getting in. So there's always a process that people are trying to, to dupe. Um, and I think that I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that this isn't bad-mouthing China in any no, way. No. A lot of great products come from China. Um, I do want to thank Clark and DJ for your time. Uh, we're almost at time. I know we ran a little bit over. Um, but I hope that uh, the folks uh, out there found the webinar very useful. Uh, this is going to be a series of webinars that we create. We're looking for ideas of things that you'd like to hear about. Uh, I hope that you found this uh, unique and interesting. And we're trying to, to push the envelope and not just hear about um, you know, the losses or the statistics. We've got a great, uh, some great information uh, behind that on the website. What we're trying to do is get the channel involved um, in this discussion to make sure they're sharing information up and down the channel uh, with their, with their uh, you know, counterparts, uh, whether that's uh, above or below you. Uh, so I want to thank you for uh, joining us and um, look forward to, to you participating in our next uh, webinar and send the ideas to us because we're interested in what you think. Uh, with that, I think we'll sign off. And again, thank you, DJ, and thank you, Clark. Thank you. And uh, stay tuned. Thank you.